Hey, what's going on? You're watching an episode of an ongoing series where we basically take a camera anywhere we want to try and find secrets and discoveries in some of our favorite games. And so far, the internet's favorite game of the past few weeks has been a brand new release called Stray. It being a game with a dedicated meow button, how could I say no? I am your host, Snipey, and with that said, let's just jump into it. There's quite a few cutscenes in Stray, but one of the perks of any of the cutscenes that happen in Engine is we can view them from whatever angle we want, and we can see all of the tricks that they end up using to get the final product. This cutscene with B12, for example, gives us a lot of the starting principles. One thing you'll notice is that if it's not being seen by the camera currently, it's probably not animating at all. And more importantly, you'll see stuff teleporting around a whole bunch. And there's a few reasons that the characters teleport around so much, but most of the time it's just for shot composition, or whatever they want to see in the camera at any given point. And these things have to happen really quick too. If on every camera change you saw the characters teleport into place, it would look pretty jarring. Things not animating when they go off camera is not anything new, but it is always funny to look at. Take these cats jumping off the ledge, for example, where when they jump off the ledge, they just get frozen in air, which I'm pretty sure is not a cat thing. And here, to achieve the angle they were looking for while keeping both characters in frame, they raised the cat a little bit off this stool. And for the sequence when you meet the robots for the first time, and you're greeted with quite a bit of hostility, there's quite a few elements that won't move until they're seen by the camera. And that's the weird part. A couple of these events are driven by the camera and not necessarily the player's position. So if you take the camera through this sequence backwards, you can play these animations out of order. And if you were ever wondering how this robot managed to escape up these stairs, I'm afraid I have to inform you that the answer is pretty much magic. As you can see, he runs up through the fence, goes a couple extra steps very awkwardly, and then disappears. And the animation of this guy slamming the fence shut is actually reused later in the game for this robot closing the door. I think it's supposed to look like he presses the button, but the animation plays so late that you can't really see it at all, and then he sprints off and disappears with just his shirt staying behind. And here's a couple of shots of what these robots look like before they run into frame. One of them is stored really far away from where their animation begins, but the other one's animation starts right where their model is. One of the features of this camera tool allows me to disable the HUD. So a thing I found on accident as I restarted a checkpoint is that I can actually see past the loading screen. And so when the game is loading a previous checkpoint, I get a full view of what the game looks like as it's loading in. And we can see a couple of cool things here. Namely, the cat and the camera are stored in default positions. And they're always loaded in first, but in this case, there's also a part of the environment that gets loaded as soon as the checkpoint does. And then the rest of the map is loaded in in these gigantic chunks. And in a similar vein, I also have footage of when you progress in an area, and then it loads the next chunk of environment. And in this example, we have a pipe that's supposed to be the transition between two different maps. And what's funny is if we remove the black screen, we can see the moment that it disappears and the cat falls directly into the void. So we just need a few seconds to talk about today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is really interesting because it's a class for creative people and folks that also want to improve their lifestyle. Whether or not you're in high school or college, Skillshare offers you an opportunity to expand your knowledge with all sorts of subjects like drawing, finance, crafts, film and video. And that's not even close to the end of it. So this week I was looking for the classes and I saw that there was one for piano playing. And I was really interested in that because I do like to play a little bit of piano in my off time, but I'm not classically trained. So I ended up checking out Piano Basics Learn Notes, Scales, and Chords with Elijah Fox Peck. His lessons taught me all about the chords, what I should be doing with my right hand, my left hand, as well as a few other core fundamentals that helped elevate me beyond playing by ear. And the first 1,000 viewers to sign up using my code she says will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. That's right, one month absolutely free. Anyways, thank you so much Skillshare, and with that said, let's get back to the show. Okay, so for some reason, this part of the map is actually host to two different instances of characters duplicating, where the one in the orange vest teleports behind the player to look like they came from the door, and then the original one wearing the lab coat just stays behind in an idle pose while the other one moves into the next area. So the approach that Stray uses to render fur convincingly is actually pretty cool. So the fur appears to be a single set of textures fully wrapped around the cat. 
But in order to give the textures the depth of fur, the artist took this layer with some alpha transparency and layered it around eight times at slightly different heights. And when you remove the fur effect, this is what the cat model actually looks like. You know what they say, the eyes are the windows to the soul. And while I'm not sure how accurate that is here, eyes have an extra level of detail that you might not have expected. So for the cats, they got a whole lot of stuff going on. They've got sort of a standard eyeball component, and then on the outside edge, it's surrounded by another sphere. And then that sphere is actually what's giving off the reflections, with the inside part of this ball being the main eye. And they don't do this explicitly just for the cats, because if we look at this wall of eyes, which I promise makes probably a little bit more sense when you play the game, we can see that the general shape is the same, although the interior is a little bit more defined in this very big hockey puck shape. And so the main component of the eye that you're focusing on is pretty small, and surprisingly, across all the characters in the game, there's an extreme level of detail in how their faces are structured, even for the robots. An interesting thing to note is on most of the robot characters, except for a select few, there's this back layer of pixels to make up the screen on their face. And so in total, you usually have about three different things going on. You've got that back layer of red, green, and blue, and then you usually have an animated decal hovering right over it, and then on the outside edge, you have the actual screen portion. And then that screen portion for the most part usually has some raindrops or something on it. And altogether, it makes this really convincing TV appearance. They go into even more detail in other objects across the game, which also happen to be TVs. So first I'm going to show you an example that's basically handled the same as the robots. You've got the back texture of pixels, which don't light up at all, and then you have the animation playing out on top of that, and then you've got the outer screen. But on this TV, all of the pixels are animated manually, or at least it gives off the appearance of the pixels being animated themselves, rather than a thing on top of them. So when you're loading up Stray, this is the first screen you'll end up seeing. And you may have noticed that it's a 3D environment that gets loaded in. And lucky for us, we get to take the camera, just kind of wherever, and doing so in this room reveals a couple secrets. First of which is that this room has walls on all sides. And I know what you're thinking, and yes, there is a ball, and if I enable player controls, I can move this ball around. And it controls really weird, I'm going to assume because it's floating, but due to that and the fact that it's untextured, I'm not sure it's really anything other than a really early playtest object. But even then, there's still plenty to see. Now you've probably noticed the lights coming through the title screen, and if we go onto the other side of it, you can see where those lights are lined up in 3D space. And what's interesting is to have them animate in the main menu, but what they've done for one of these lights is they've introduced a box that moves back and forth and blocks it from emitting this super bright light. Meanwhile, the bottom light moves completely separately and isn't blocked at any point. And yeah, this title screen is a really big image with transparency through it, and the sides are just additional black squares. And for you moon truthers out there, I've got a little surprise for you. Turns out, the moon's been flat this whole time, and it's actually really big and really close by to the ground. Some of the windows across the game you may have noticed look like they've actually got rooms on the inside. But there's actually a little bit of clever trickery going on here. You see, this is a shader technique called interior parallax. And what it does is it creates the illusion of interiors with proper perspective, without actually adding any additional geometry. And so if we push the camera through this window, you'll see the illusion break and the image disappear. And speaking of illusions, this barrel of fire has one that you probably expected, but not to this degree. So if we move up to this barrel, the fire is always facing towards the camera. Now, this is a pretty common thing in order to save resources, but what's interesting about it is that this fire is actually not just a single layer. It's multiple different layers on top of each other, and each of them face the camera. So if we point the camera towards the ground, for instance, the fire actually comes out of the edge of the barrel, which is pretty goofy looking. And you don't even need a free cam for that. You can just do that while playing as the cat. By the way, at a couple places in the game, there are fully functioning pool tables, for some reason. And so when you knock the balls into the pockets, they collect in a little reservoir in the table. 
I think it's no surprise that probably the biggest set piece of the game has one of the most intricate and thought out animations, and that's at the end of the game when you finally open up the city, and the seal at the top opens up. And if we take the camera above, we can see a much better angle of how this animation's actually playing out, with all the rings lifting up separately and moving into each individual position. And then when they get stored outside of this circle, then another row of metal closes these off, and then what used to be the ceiling is stored in this small circular hallway completely around the map. There's a couple of unique pieces of geometry that I managed to find in my playthrough of Stray, and that's these really big red gridded boxes. I only found two in the entire game. Like, these things are rare. <laughs> And unfortunately, I can only speculate as to why these are here. Feel free to leave your guess in the comments below. So usually across the game, characters don't really spawn in unless they're necessary. Even if an introduction to an area doesn't have that many characters, and then after the cutscene there's a whole bunch more, you don't usually end up finding any of them stored outside of the map. But this rule doesn't apply to everybody, because if we take the camera over to this building on the edge of the map, there's a character that we won't be seeing for another few chapters, stored outside the bounds for a later cutscene. And in the upper levels, we have a similar story with another character, who is stored under this tunnel in an A-pose. There seems to be an asset that's the interior of a building that gets reused over and over again, but there's nothing actually inside it other than a whole bunch of super reflective tiling. I'm not entirely sure if they're cut content, but they're very shiny. When you load into a level, even if only that first chunk is loaded, typically all the characters and objects that you end up seeing or using are loaded in at the start. Take this clip from the character Doc, whose house is no longer there, but we can see him reclining in the air, a couple of enemies still loaded in, and this tracker stored under the floor, which actually has some really tiny details on it. Stray makes some effective use out of trees, by the way. I mean, they're constantly merged in the wall, or floating in the air, and while in a lot of cases looking at them from another angle ends up being a little silly, nothing will ever be quite as silly as these two trees floating really high up above the first level. I'm not even sure if you can see either of these. And they don't just reuse trees to build these environments, they reuse a lot of the same light too. This lamp is used across the entire game as probably most of the lights you end up seeing off in the distance. Now I'm sure you've seen the part of the light that looks a little bit untextured, and what's weird is that if we go behind the light and look in, you can see that the untextured bit is actually part of the full model of this light bulb. There's a pretty big set of lights on this wall, and instead of being a tiny light hooked onto the end of these boxes, the objects making these lights are just big cylinders. And since a couple of the lights are off, we can see that when they're not emitting light, they're just left with the default Unreal Engine textures. And this one compound looking building has a really bright red light on top of it that you can see from basically anywhere on the map, and moving the camera a little bit closer reveals that it's just a really tiny floating red orb. And probably the weirdest light that I found in the game is actually in one of the first areas that you end up going to, and that's in this little sewer section before you get into the main city. Looking up in normal gameplay gives off the illusion that you're still outside somewhat, with the blinding light appearing as sunshine. A closer look reveals that not only is it not that at all, it's this really gigantic rectangle of light. Here's a thing that I'm not sure if anybody's actually seen, but above this tree village, there's a whole bunch of unique geometry, namely this gigantic grate. It covers the entire ceiling of this area, and it has a really cool pattern on it. Okay, so something to note basically through all the beginning chapters, this upper level of the city is almost always fully visible in a low level of detail state. So even as you progress and other areas of the map no longer become visible, this upper area is always there.
Okay, so one of the questions that I had really early on actually got answered super, super late into the game, basically right near the end. So when I was taking the camera around, I noticed that a lot of these windows at the top of the wall have these black boxes around them, except for like three of them. And then I was wondering to myself, why do these three windows not have boxes on them if every other one does? And then I learned later in the game that those three windows are actually part of the environment for a later level, where you're actually able to overlook the entire city. And even though this entire area is low level of detail, there's still a lot of stuff being rendered here, possibly helped out due to the fact that most of these are simple shapes, but it was still really impressive to look at. And so to end this video off, I wanted to give you guys a loving pan of this low level of detail city. As for this outro, again, if you think I should do anything differently, if you want some changes, please feel free to comment them down below. I am all ears. I'll be reading as many of your guys' comments as I can, because let's face it, I want to improve. I want you guys to enjoy what I make, and hopefully you enjoyed this video. As always, massive thank you to She Says. I have no idea how I'm here. I, I don't know how this is happening, but I am so thankful for this opportunity. And with that being said, whenever you're watching this, I hope you have a great day, and I will see you guys in the next one. See ya.